you have to see the optimism in a, in a business, right? And you have to also recognize when a company has challenges, that they're solvable, that there's good people in there, right? For example, when we get into an inflationary environment, sometimes people will worry or forget that a company can adjust its pricing fairly carefully. For listeners who are unfamiliar with Jason and Jesse, they run Donville Kent Asset Management, a fund based in Toronto. On your website, you have one of my favorite Warren Buffett quotes. If you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Can you give the audience a broad overview of your fund and your major investing philosophy? Yeah, sure. That's kind of a good introduction. We're, we're ultimately looking for compounders like Buffett, looking for stocks that we're not trying to catch a, a two or three month pop. We're looking at stocks that, that we think can grow at a, at a, at a rate that is well above with the, where the stock market is growing and to do so for a long period of time. And typically that business has some kind of a moat built around it. It's got some kind of a competitive advantage. So for us is to try to look at a company and figure out what that sustainability is. And if we think we have a compounder, uh, we ease into the position and ideally we try to hold it for as long as we can. And so with your investing process, obviously you guys are only looking for businesses that are, are going to be compounding preferably for many years, I assume. Yeah, we're generally not. Let's say you called me up and said, hey, there's a company coming out. I'm, I don't have insider information, but just based on all the circumstances, I'm pretty sure that they're going to beat, they're going to surprise the market in two weeks time, right? And I look at the business, I say, okay, but long term, I don't really want to own a business like this because it doesn't have a competitive advantage, whoever. I wouldn't react to that call. I would say, thanks, but I, I'm not looking to, to buy those trades on just stocks where there's a, a positive development coming, that kind of thing. We're looking for, like Buffett is, He's also said in a similar vein, if, if you were required to hold everything that you bought for five years uh, and you weren't allowed to sell it for five years, you, you, would, you would view stock selection way differently. And we try to do the same thing. You guys specialize in smaller market cap businesses, but as you grow assets under management, smaller cap businesses won't move the needle as much. Will you have to adjust your strategy on small cap businesses as assets under management grow? Jesse, you want to take that one? Yeah, it's a fair question. And Jason could probably give you some exact examples of hedge funds that did exactly that. They outgrew their their specialty and guess what? Performance declined. We've seen that again and again, and there's studies out there that'll show you kind of what the ideal size of a fund is. And for us, we've done that math and we're not going to go over the size that precludes us from that small cap area. We We very much, our own money's in the fund. So we very much err on the side of performance versus empire building. It's a very good point. We're very aware of it. I think more people should be aware of it. But uh, you know, yeah, that's not an issue that we're kind of have front and center for us right now. And uh, you mentioned a couple of names that Jason's gone through. Can you provide those names? Uh, I don't know if he wants to name specific funds, Jason, that kind of got too big for their britches. How about just, you know, what was the process like for them? We've seen companies like, let's say in, in our space in Canada, where they were 100 million, 150 million AUM, and they got really successful and they suddenly they were at a billion dollars, right? And they couldn't get enough of those small undervalued names that they could drive their portfolio. So they got forced into the TSX 60. They ended up owning the same large stuff that everybody else owns. And guess what? Their performance kind of got, went that way as well. What are your average holding periods like for your fund? Do you always look for businesses that you think you can hold for five to 10 years, or are you sometimes looking at maybe special situations or any type of arbitrage type deals? No, we're always looking for the long term. But here's what happens. What's particularly when you have a company like a large cap, which we have in the portfolio called Constellation Software, it's got a long track record, easy to analyze and, and easy to see that it's just going to keep on chugging, right? When you look at a small company, you don't have that track record. So you think you might be buying a compounder and then a year later, six months later, you realize that they've got issues. We go in with the idea of, yes, the compounder, five, 10 year outlook. And then you could ask, well, the why is your holding period five to 10 years? And like Jason said, sometimes you don't, sometimes your investment thesis doesn't necessarily play out. And that's why we start small. We start with what we call kind of like a total position. And then if they do what they say they're going to do, then we add over time. So for a stock to end up being a large position, we've owned it for most likely multiple years. So that's kind of on the risk mitigation side. And then what can also happen is, you know, new names come up or you need funds. So you, you, you rank your stocks and one ranks well above other ones. And you use that, uh, that, that stock as a source of capital for your new investment, right? 
that's kind of, you know, why there might be more turnover, but on average, it is multiple years on average holding for our fund. So you mentioned that toehold investment to kind of get started. What, what does that usually look like before you gain enough uh, conviction and an idea to go into a full position? Yeah. So say start out with, you know, half a percent weighting in the fund and you meet with management, you do your models, all, all that kind of, and then you kind of, you see their next quarter, it's as expected or not. And then you reevaluate. And if the stock starts to perform, then you add. So it's, it's a combination of, you know, is there momentum, it, you know, our revenues and the margins and execution, what you thought it would be. And if that's the case, then, you know, you can slowly add over time. So I, like, kind of like we said, so like by the time it's a larger position, you've met management 20 times or more, and you've gone, you know, through all the calls and you've updated your model 20 times. And so you get to know the company. We argue, we, we would know our large companies, you know, better than anyone else kind of out there. And that's because it, it's years and years of research. So you mentioned uh, Constellation Software, which is a business that I highly respect. With the success of their business model, why do you think other businesses haven't attempted to copy their model in different industries? It's a great question. And we've had Constellation like going back right to the beginning of the fund. So we, we, when we started, the first, first time we bought the stock, it was, it was a $20 stock. And for your listeners, it's now almost a $3,000 stock. Plus, there's been two spin outs from it, right? So, and it was only a $500 million market cap. So it was a true small cap when we started investing in it, right? There have actually been a few people who said, oh, we're going to do what, what Constellation did. But it, it requires a lot of d- uh, discipline. And Mark Leonard has put in a system there of how to look at companies, kind of companies that fit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and how to integrate them into the, the broader whole. That is, it's really, really interesting. And you look at it and you go, well, anybody could copy that. And then they try it and they don't. There, there is something in terms of the internal culture that I think is, is hard to put your finger on it. But that being said, the two spin outs, Lumine and Topicus, seem to be operating exactly the same way. It is on some level replicable, but sometimes you'll hear people comparing it, for example, to Danaher or something like that. And you look at Constellation's numbers over the last 15 years versus Danaher, and it's not even close. I think it's a good question because the company over the years has put out a lot of information on process and you know what they look for. So you like it's not like it's a black box, but it is their discipline and it's the machine. But to be fair, there has been off the top of my head, like Alimentation Kushtart or MTY Food or Boyd Group Automotive, which for maybe not as long as a period did have kind of a similar type of strategy and growth and success, but not on the same scale as uh, Constellation. It's a good question. It, it kind of gets to the point of like vertical market software. So they're vertical market software consolidator. And the idea about VMS software is the fact that it is extremely small and niche, right? So they're doing hundreds of acquisitions a year of six, seven, eight million dollars plus some larger ones. And that's the whole idea is private equity won't play in a niche VMS. And then again, the idea of, be, of having a system in place where you can do that many deals is, is very hard to do, right? And also get in front of that many companies. So it sounds easy, but I think, yeah, I think like Jason said, they're, they're disciplined and I think they have a machine in place that allows them to do it. Yeah. And one additional follow-up on Constellation, as they've grown now, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. They're doing like, they're still doing like $5 million deals, but now obviously in order to really move the mark, they're starting to move up to deals that are 500, I think $700 million. What do you think about their internal rates return on these types of acquisitions? Are they going to be able to maintain their hurdle rates going forward? That's a great question. And then, and here's how people who are listening in who are do-it-yourselfers can, can look at it, right? Is when you have a company that's growing over, you know, through acquisitions, so let's say any company, Constellation right now, and they're doing 10 acquisitions per, per year, what you do is you start looking at over time, what's happening to their margins? Are their margins going down? Are they going sideways? Are they going up? Because if they're going down, then that means incrementally, they're adding probably weaker businesses into the mix than what they already have, right? We were quite attuned to that because it's 50% of the growth through acquisition or roll-up companies turn out to be crap. Just when someone says, oh my God, they're doing a roll-up strategy on the uh, dry cleaning business. Don't, don't get all excited because half the time these things turn out to be crap, right? So that is one of the ways you can look and say, in- incrementally, are they on, on average, because that constellation does a lot of acquisitions, are they on average adding businesses that are, that are roughly as attractive as the ones they're running? Or are they worse or are they better? Equally, if they buy a company that's okay in the first year and then turns out to be crap, same thing, you'll get this fading in their margins and in their return on capital. So when you take that criteria and you look at Constellation or Topless or Luminous, 
generally speaking, the, the margins and the return on capital are stable or rising. They're incrementally adding really good businesses. And that's not what you'd expect because before Berkshire Hathaway and, and, and companies like Constellation and Danaher, there was a belief in teaching that conglomerates were, were inefficient, that they were, you don't want conglomeration because individual investors want to pick their own pieces kind of stuff. And a, a conglomerate would com- become this mediocre basket. And that's clearly not the case with Constellation. Not to focus on Constellation too much, but to, to get to your point of, we've had this discussion and this discussion has been brought up about Constellation getting too big, right? Like, and we had this $80 a share, at $200 a share, at $500. Like we've had this along this whole entire path. And just to kind of put some numbers to it, in their funnel of VMS software businesses, they have, a, it's like 300,000 that they're tracking. And it's estimated that there's about a million out there, right? So if you do that, if they continue on their pace, Mark Leonard, where it was this, it was, we had a meeting with the CFO and he was saying their issue isn't enough VMS targets. It's getting in front of them when those targets look to sell. Not a mom and pop at $5 million valuation don't know who Constellation is unless Constellation was knocking on the door and sitting down with them and that's their issue. And they seem to have reorganized the business a few years ago where they accelerated that. So again, with we're harboring a constellation, but the idea that they'll have to go up market for acquisitions isn't the case, but they do opportunistically get acquisitions on the larger scale, but they don't drop their internal IRR on those acquisitions. Again, we're harboring a constellation, but the idea that they'll, they'll have to go up market for acquisitions isn't the case, but they do opportunistically get acquisitions on the larger scale, but they don't drop their internal IRR on those acquisitions. So institutions can go in and buy stocks once they reach a specific market cap size. So some small caps with less than 50 to $100 million market caps just simply can't be purchased by institution. But you said that they can come in around $100 plus million. Then as more eyeballs come on the stock, the stock can often re-rate. So do you guys have a specific market cap range that you'd consider your sweet spot? We'll look at anything, but historically that... The sweet spot in the Canadian market has been kind of starting at the 250 to 300 million market cap, where you buy a stock around there and, and you ride it as it goes from 300 million to two and a half billion. And you get that over four or five years, you get that combination of the, the company, let's say, growing at 16 or 17% a year plus the multiple expansion. So it gives you a, something compounding at 21, 22%. We're comfortable coming in earlier than that. We're just not going to bet the farm on, 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 on a stock that's earlier because. Because even if you find a stock that's growing, let's say you find a stock that's on five times earnings and it's growing at 20% a year, even if there's no re-rating a year from now, it should still be on five times earnings. So if nothing else, you're still getting the growth rate. Whereas the lottery ticket comes from the potential that it comes onto more radar screens and it gets that multiple lift. So we have a few stocks under $100 million in market cap, but uh, we also have you know companies like Constellation, which is now, I don't know, 60 or $70 billion market cap. So we're, we're not obsessed with small caps. We just tend to have more of them because that's where the value is. For the audience, it's really interesting these days specifically because as the market cap grows, you know, then all of a sudden you, you can pick up analyst coverage, which obviously gets more eyeballs. And some investment advisors can't own a stock unless it is a buy from an analyst, et cetera. So you, you see that market cap step function. But what's very important these days is index inclusion. And Jason and I were just talking about this because you get included with the, the increased passive investing, the amount of money in ETFs soon as you get, say, included in the Russell or booted out of the Russell, like the, the implications are, are, are big, right? So if you have a $200 million market cap company that you think in two or three years will be, will get to a size that'll get included into an index, it, that, it, 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 that is a massive catalyst. But then with that comes, you know, more volatility and all that kind of stuff. But the, the idea of getting into indexes as you grow is, is considerable. So I'd be interested in knowing what are your exit signals for your holdings? Do you prefer using specific price targets or are you looking for cracks in the fundamentals, nonsensical valuations, or better opportunities as your sell signals? Yeah, pretty much the latter what you described, right? So either the return on capital is starting to fade, the valuation has got uh, ridiculous, or if we feel like management for some reason, we don't, we feel like we can trust management. Every now and then you get a management team that just suddenly it's, it's obvious that they're taking care of their own needs first and shareholders second. So it's those, those are the three criteria. Basically, a change in, in that we no longer view it as a, a com- the compounder that we want to own, the valuation gets crazy, or uh, a question of integrity. 
And I think a third would go along with the fundamentals is if they take on too much leverage. So they do a deal and they take on too much debt. Because as soon as you take on too much debt, even if it's a good deal, your optionality is gone. Now you are you don't have that, up, that optionality anymore and you brought on risk. So that's another reason. A couple of examples I would say was we owned for a long time was both MTY Food Group and Dollarama. So Dollarama out dollar stores, MTY Food Court restaurants. And what happened is phenomenal growth, phenomenal economics. On an individual basis, those, each of those units is still very good economics, but then they just, they ran out of runway. So their growth starts to slow. They start to, for Dollarama, like their growth is pretty much just the growth of suburbs in Canada now. And then for MTY, they had to expand to more restaurants in the US. And along with that, their ROE started to drop. So we held them for years, but then we rank other stocks and we kind of move on. But they're kind of past their growth that we, that we're looking for it. How do you guys view cash in volatile markets? Do you tend to stay fully invested through market cycles or do you increase your cash holdings when markets begin heating up and driving up evaluation so you can hopefully try to take advantage of large corrections? We're pretty much always fully invested. And people ask us, well, you know, if you say you're net 80 or you're net 200, so you're twice on cash or you're, you're hump set levered or you're timing the market. You're implying that you're timing the market, right? Like you think the market's going to correct or it's at a bottom and we don't think we have that expertise. So we stay fully invested as long as our companies continue to grow revenue and earnings per share and have a high ROE, then we continue to hold, right? And that can be painful. Like I'm sure we'll talk about how markets declined, especially in the small cap space in Canada over the last kind of two years. But guess what? Like record revenues, record earnings per share high ROEs, right? So it's one of those things where, yeah, it can be painful in the short term, but the companies are performing. Most of the greatest investors I've researched tend to be very optimistic in their outlook on investing in a life. How do you guys view optimism as part of your outlook on individual stocks in the market? It's a good point because the people who are, who are the opposite, who are cynical or, or highly skeptical, right? And they put that out as one of their virtues. And then we look at their numbers and they're always, they're always crappy, right? Like, I think Buffett, once again, has written about, you have to see the possibility in commerce. You have to see the optimism in a, in a business, right? And you have to also recognize when a company has challenges, that they're solvable, that there's good people in there, right? You know, for example, when we get into an inflationary environment, sometimes people will worry or forget that a company can adjust its pricing fairly carefully. When you look at a large company like a, an Amazon or a, a Walmart or whatever, we've just gone through an inflationary cycle and their margins haven't changed that much, right? So they're their ability to adjust to a changing environment is, 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 is excellent, right? So I think I am optimistic. I don't think I'm stupidly optimistic. I also think there's a couple of key things in the stock market. There's always a worry about the consumer, right? Consumer debt, consumer this, that, and the other thing. The consumer is you and I. And when we have a problem in our lives, most of us adjust really quickly to that problem. So when people say, well, I'm really worried about the consumer right now because of this, that, and the other thing, Governments and, and, and some cor- large kind of stale corporations can be very, very slow at adjusting to problems. Households adjust to them right friggin' now because th- that's the reality that we all live in. I'm not worried about the, I, I tend to be w- way more optimistic on the consumer. And yeah, I think we, you know, my optimism is that I think the world is geared towards growth. It's, it's, cor- it's geared towards inventing new things, making new things, making uh, the world a better place. But I, I don't think it takes me away from the judgment of saying this is crap or these guys don't know what they're doing. I think I got that side. I, I, I got that, that side of my brain is fairly well developed as well. It, it is hard because sometimes it's the pessimist that sounds smart on TV, right? And that's what makes good headlines. That's what makes good media. But that's what Jason, like over time, it's, it's wrong. It's a hard balance of like, do you want to sound smart or do you want to, you want to have some good investments? So it's, it's, that's the world we live in. Like the stock market in general is not a, is not a coin toss. It's not 50-50. At the start of every year, if you just own the index, it, it's not a 50-50 chance that you're going to make money. It's skewed towards going up. It goes up more years than it goes down. And in the average year that it goes up, it goes up by more than it goes down in the, in the, in the negative year. So the cumulative effect of owning an ETF or a portfolio for 10 years, the probability that you're not going to make money is extremely low. It's not a 50-50 coin toss the way some of the cynics will, will point out, right? Jason, you mentioned in Chris Mayer's 100 Baggers that returns on equity, which I'll just refer to as ROE. I'm pretty sure the audience is going to know that, but it is a decent proxy for the returns you can get from investing in businesses over the long term. 
And then in your interview in Market Masters, you mentioned that growth in book value is a good indicator that a stock is increasing in value. Do you think this concept applies to all businesses in all industries, especially in respect to, you know, say like a tech versus a CapEx heavy retail type business? First of all, let's go back to the first part, which is return on equity and growth and book value is more or less the same thing. If your book value goes by 20%, your ROE is essentially 20%. So in a sense, it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. The challenge though that's happened in my investing career is that balance sheets are getting distorted by a lot of different things, which means uh, calculating the, the true return on equity of a business, which can still be done, is not a five-minute exercise with a calculator and the financial statements. You would have to go back over the, almost the history of the company and re-add everything in and all that kind of stuff. So we're increasingly looking at things like the relation between margin, sales growth, that kind of stuff, and saying, if this company had a normalized balance sheet, it would probably be a 25% ROE company. One of the other sort of metrics that investors can look at is this rule, rule of 40 that people use for software companies, but it's actually worth looking at any, any company with, which is just basically saying, look at the profit margin of the company. And in, in this case, we would call it the cash earnings uh, profit margin. Let's just say it's 20%. It's not that different from EBITDA. So let's just say it has a 20% EBITDA margin and it's growing by its revenues by 20%. Those combined pieces come out to 40%. With a lot of companies, that rule of 40 number is not too far away from where their ROE is. And so if you have a low margin company that's low growth, even though it's on five times PA, it could be a value trap, right? Equally, if you have a high ROE company, and this is not one in the portfolio, but it's, it's, a, it's an example that everybody can, can look at, which is Apple. Apple has super high margins, but not a lot of growth right now, but it has like a 50% margin. So they're growing to some extent by buying back their stock every year because they're so profitable. That means Every dollar that you spend at Apple, 50% of it goes to profit. That's how, how big their, their, their mode is, right? So those, now ideally, what you want is a company that, let's say, has a 30% profit margin and 20% growth. But looking at that metric, that rule of 40 metric, where you add together basically the revenue growth rate of the company and the margin as another excellent proxy for looking for a high quality business. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. To break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over, watching the savings you do have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite, or freeing yourself from the corporate grind requires that you master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. And Jason has used Apple as an example, so I pulled it up just to kind of give the listeners an an idea of what we're talking about. Businesses don't necessarily operate their companies off their balance sheet, right? Like financials do. But with Apple, so Apple has 60 billion in equity on the reported balance sheet. And they're going to make a hundred billion in earnings. So 167% ROE. Do they have 167% ROE? No, they don't. Right. But that's, that's what, if you just did took your textbook calculation would tell you, but what you will have to do is Jason and I, if we really, like, if we were digging into it, we would go and okay, what's their real cash margin? What type of leverage factor? So that's where that DuPont analysis comes in. What type of leverage factor? What type of asset turnover do they have? So like Jason said, they have a really high net margin. So they're going to have a high ROE. Their stocks compounded the last 20 years at like 39%. So that probably gives you in the range of what their ROE has been with some multiple expansion, right? Now, Constellation Software at times has had negative equity on the balance sheet. So how do you calculate an ROE then? Like it's the same type of idea. You break it down into your parts. So it's, it is a lot more cumbersome than your finance 101 class would kind of tell you it is, but that's kind of how we really kind of delve into it. So it's, it, it's more work than just screening for higher week companies. Piggybacking on this question, and, and you kind of answered it already, but so a business like I, IBM, I looked at, and if you look, like you said, at the textbook definition of ROE, it was, it was high, like 27% for a decade, but like pretty recently, but it had a massive debt load. So the ROE looked super attractive, but when you looked at returns on invested capital and added debt back in, It was bad, mid single digits. And then when you look at the share price, they basically were destroying shareholder value during this time. Do you guys, when you're doing the ROE, do you guys take into account, you must take into account debt. So like 
how does how do you how do you guys kind of compare the ROE versus ROIC numbers? Are they do you use them interchangeably or how do you guys look at them? I mean, first of all, we have a we don't want to own a company that if you take it, their annual cash flows that they couldn't pay it all back in four years. So, it's, so it's, they've got to be four years or less, right? But that's the upper limit for us. Typically, we want to own companies that are at two times or less because that means that they've got the capacity to do big, big acquisition, right? But let's say we own a company that's uh, you know got two years of debt and then they do a big acquisition, the stock pops, and, but now it's got four years of debt. We're likely to that would be a stock we might take pr- some profits in or something like that because. They're not likely to acquire anything for a while. So they're, they're, if they're a grow to acquisition company, they're just going to spend the next two or three years paying down that, that debt before they can really take anything on. Or they're going to do a dilutive financing or something like that, right? So we look at that balance sheet level all the time. As well, when we look at a company that has a high ROE, but maybe it's not reflected in certain other metrics, one of the first things we'll say is, oh, the only reason their ROE is high is they're leveraged up the wazoo, but they're not actually running a great business. So we're adjusting for that. But Let's say a company just sort of comes to my attention that I've never looked at before. You know, one of the first things that I'll look at is just pull up the 10-year sh- share price chart. If this business is, is as it appears to me right now, it should be reflected in, in a chart that is showing the company performing over time. And if that company has been going sideways or whatever, then the qu- first question I have to ask myself is, is it, did it suddenly get changed? Is there somebody improving it? Like, is there something new going on here? Or what explains why, if these numbers are putting up numbers like this, what explains why this stock hasn't gone anywhere? And sometimes it's a phenomenon like good year, bad year, good year, bad year, good year, bad year phenomena. Sometimes it's a change. You know, we've seen some pretty interesting turnarounds in companies where they change management or they reposition themselves. Sometimes in the SaaS area, it's a company converting over from the old system of, of, of purchasing software to subscription models. And they often will have a, an 18-month period where their numbers will kind of make it look like they're not doing too well. And in fact, it's just the, tr- conver- the conversion. And often if you can get in late in that conversion, you can actually do re- really, really well. I'm interested in knowing how you use ROE just with upcoming businesses that aren't yet optimized for profitability. So are you using an adjusted number? I guess you, you mentioned using EBITDA. And how's this adjusted number been a good measure for you guys for future value creation? I think so for a company that's kind of just coming, like looks, but we think it's going to be a higher ROE company, but stock quite there. We're looking at the trend, right? We're looking at the direction it's moving. So I'll give you an example, a company called Dochebo. Right, which uh, software company, you know, it's kind of headquartered in Canada, but does a lot of their operations in Italy. This company was unprofitable, and now it's starting to move towards break even, but it's still on a pretty high multiple. It's probably on forty or fifty times, right? So this is one that I'm watching, where it's like, okay, at some point, this I think is going to become a fairly interesting company. The question is, is it today or, or is it twelve months from now? But the trend line, they've gone from being quite significant losses to above break even now. So that trend line is exactly where you want to go. And if you can catch a company that's going through that re-rating, they can often be real rocket ships. Yeah, I think Jason, Jason said that since uh, the first day I started working here. Is he goes, what's the only thing better than a high ROE business is a company becoming a high ROE business. Because then with that, you get the multiple expansion and the new eyeballs and all that a- along the way, right? Like you're saying, there's margins and there's growth and there's ways to project out what it could be over time. So that's kind of what we're doing. So since you guys like to invest in businesses with such a high ROE, this usually means that from a business standpoint, the best use of earnings is to pump it back into the business at the uh, high rates of return. So a business that you guys own, such as Hammond Power Supply, pays a small dividend, uh, whereas a business like Decisive Dividend pays a pretty big dividend. How do you guys analyze businesses with high ROE but are also distributing profits back to shareholders as dividends? From just from a mathematical standpoint, we have something that's called a sustainable growth rate. You take that ROE, say it's 20%, and we'll use decisive dividend as an example, but they aim to have their payout ratio at like 60%, but I think it's like 42% right now, right? So anyways, 20% ROE, they pay out 42%. So that's a sustainable growth rate of roughly 12%, right? So that's how we kind of start to do apples to apples. And then you're like, okay, as a shareholder, then you obviously get the yield as well, which is around 6%. So you're roughly 18% as a return, which you can compare to an 18% ROE or an 18% yield with no growth. Like it's, it's, a way to, it's a way to compare apples to apples. So we have something that we, that we call, un, internally we call the sustainable growth rate. And that's, and that's kind of how we calculate it. So then we can compare that growth rate to its earnings and we'll say, well, how much growth are we getting per unit of value? Anyway, so that's kind of like the technical way we do it. Jason, you kind of have an idea? 
Yeah, essentially what Jesse's saying is we can convert a dividend paying stock, uh, it's convert its ROE. We have, there's, a, there's a formula, and we didn't invent the formula, I guess it's, it's in the textbooks. So you can say, okay, this 20% ROE company, given its, di- di- its di- dividend is actually a 17% ROE company. We're typically trying to find 20% ROE companies, but we'll take something a little bit lower than that if, if we like the, you know, the valuation and all that kind of thing. Can you guys talk a little bit about Hammond Power Supply? I'd love to know what is it about that business that you guys like so much? Yeah, so it's a new name. It's not a massive name for us. And we'll get to what they do. But what I'll start with is we don't invest in like a theme necessarily, right? The investment was found in the true margins and growth and valuation. That's where we always start is with the numbers. The numbers led us to this company. Net margins have doubled over the past couple of years and continue to grow and growth has accelerated. So you look at a company, like Jason said, we'll pull up the stock price chart. Why has it been doing well recently and not in the past? It's like, well, because margins are doubling and growth's accelerating, right? Okay, well, what's that play there? So Hammond Power is the leading manufacturer of transformers and why, and okay, that's great for infrastructure, but the idea that the almost every single city in the entire world needs to upgrade its infrastructure if they want to hit their EV or heating goals. Because if we hit the goals now with the way the infrastructure is, the, the grid can't handle it. I have a couple, I'm just pulling up my email of a couple of studies, but there was a study in Palo Alto that more than 95% of residential transformers will be overloaded if the city hits at 20, 30 electrical targets. So pretty much all, all of the grids will get overloaded if they hit the targets that they're trying to push for. And then there's another one that where most electrical grids, the clusters themselves are designed to be cooled at night because that's when electrical demand is less. But if we hit our EV targets, that's when everyone's charging their EVs. The idea that a level two charger used to be, used to last 30 to 40 years because it kind of went through that cycle. But they're predicting that it'll last three years if it, if it has to hit this kind of like like always on, always working type of model, right? So that's the reason. So when Jason was mentioning before of like, well, what's changed? That's one of their fastest growing segments is on like kind of like the EV renewable side, but then it's just the grid in general, right? It's air conditioning, it's these buildings, it's growth in population. It's the need for these transformers where you can stand back and you go, okay, it makes sense that growth accelerating and margins are improving and the stock still looks extremely cheap for its size. So that's kind of the Hammond Power investment in kind of a nutshell. They are expanding capacity at two sites. So when you when you ask about growth, you know, you have to be able to make these transformers at scale. And with their expansion that's undergoing, they should be able to grow revenue over 50% with those two expansions. So we think it's a good growth, good margin, good return, and still looks fairly cheap to us. Excellent. And what about, um, can you give me the, your uh, nutshell for um, decisive dividend as well? Sure. Jason, do you want to take that one? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward manufacturing company. The people that run it have uh, a good background, both in acquiring companies and also in running companies. And uh, really, it is an arbitrage, I guess, between the fact that you can buy small industrial companies that manufacture things like heating supply stuff or fireplaces or whatever bundle those companies together, pay out a dividend, and the market will pay you, you know, pay you a good rate. Stock has been great. I'm not suggesting in any way this is a consolation software, but as they acquire more businesses, their dependency on any single business diminishes over time. So it becomes more of a diversified basket of, of manufacturing companies that uh, have good cash flows and um, creates a lot of value. The payout ratio is reasonable right now. So even if there's a little bit of a whoops, they should be able to kind of get through from a, a dividend payout point of view. We like it. We met with management twice in the last uh, three or four months. It's early days still, but the stock's performing uh, quite well. And like I said, very, very, very attractive dividend. So you've mentioned in a previous interview a couple of years ago that you shifted your strategy from looking mostly at profitable businesses to more tech type businesses that are maybe sacrificing a little bit of profitability now to improve relationships with potential customers. Just wondering what brought this strategy change on? I think we're still f- fairly focused on profitability. It's just, it's more like what Jesse talked about before, which is the ROE is on its way to where we want it to go. So let's say I'm using a Deutsche Bros as an example of something we're looking at right now, right? But you, you were getting all these really interesting tech companies that, that, you know, like Magnet Forensics, for example, that came out and, and now it's disappeared because it went private. But 
you're getting all these interesting tech companies and we had to be just a little bit more flexible because a lot of them were in really, really fast growing places where they were focused on market share and, and, and things like that more than they were focused on uh, the bottom line profitability. So we just wanted to give ourselves a bit more of that flexibility. But I still think if, if you go through the portfolio, we don't own very many, very many stocks that are not profitable. They just may not quite have the ROE today that we think they're going to have in a year or two. I don't think I would call it a change in strategy because it's still pairing growth, profitability, valuation. But I think what happened was like with SaaS specifically, it's, it's one of the best business models that there ever has been, right? In the sense of how you can scale and how profitable you can be. And then what Jason was getting to is like it literally, literally let, there was probably 10 tech names you could count in Canada for years, BlackBerry, Constellation, CGI, open text. And then there's been, there has been like kind of an explosion of new up and coming, like Jason mentioned, Magnet Forensics, where really interesting new tech names came to the market. So it was starting to evaluate these new businesses that are new to the market, not new businesses that have been around. And that was kind of what, well, your, your tech weighting's up significantly. Well, it's not necessarily us trying to invest in tech. It's us just trying to invest in the best companies we can find, and which happens to be tech because you can have high growth, high margins in tech. So that's kind of been what's happened, but I wouldn't necessarily call that a change in strategy. So I've noticed over the years, your fund has also moved towards investing in business that are coming out of the IFPO phase. What advantages are you seeing in Canadian businesses that are entering public markets this way? Yeah. So I think it kind of just goes back to what we were just referencing was for years, there just wasn't anything coming to market that kind of fit what we were looking for. And now there, now there is with real companies, real earnings market. And we did a significant amount of work on this in, this past, in one of our past newsletters, but people are like, well, why now? And it's because the business models work now. The cost of being in the cloud, the speed and accessibility of the internet, the proliferation of the smartphone, you add all those together and guess what? You actually, you can have, you can have real business models in the cloud on phone around the world, right? Where that, that just wasn't the case. The cost of the cloud was too much or bandwidth wasn't enough. And you kind of got this perfect storm of infrastructure and accessibility all at the same time. So the, the idea that, you know, new business models could work was a real thing. Again, I, we're a very concentrated fund, so we're, we weren't adding a ton of these, but every one or two a year, you're taking a really good look at some, some new business a couple of times a year. And so just to follow up about the IPOs in Canada versus US, I don't know how much you guys follow US markets, but it seems like in the US, a lot of these businesses are IPOing now, like way later in their growth stages. Is there something specific about Canada that is allowing these businesses to IPO earlier? Is there just more need for capital from these businesses? Or what are the differences you see in Canada versus US? The only thing that I see in Canada, because we watch but the IPO market will kind of is like open and closed, open and closed, right? So I think we watch the US tech market fairly closely. And I think Canada and the US are, have some similarities, but where, one of the differences in Canada is companies will go public as much smaller companies, right? Like a company is, is happy to go public with a $100 million market cap. That smaller company in the States really gets orphaned. It's questionable whether you should go public or that small in, in the States, whereas in Canada, you'll, you'll get paid attention to. So that would be, that's one of the things that I, I would say is different. But there are tons of, co- like the SPACs and the pre-profitable companies in the States, they had tons of those as well. We have them in Canada, but we don't know a lot about them because we don't spend a lot of time looking at the, the pre-profitable ones. But as they, but we ha- keep them in databases. So as the, at, with every quarter that goes by, as they go from being unprofitable to profitable, we go, hey, maybe it's time to revisit company X, Y, Z kind of thing. And there's definitely a few of those in, in Canada, the tech companies that went public two or three years ago that have been doing actually fine on a revenue bit, business development side, but they're slowly but surely working their way to profitability. And, and we could come in before they're profitable if we think the trend line is fast enough, right? So. I'm interested in knowing, well, out of the companies that you guys have owned during this, the entirety of the fund, what have you held on to the longest? Does this go to Constellation Software? What other names have you guys held for long periods of time? Uh, we've had that for a long time. Colliers would be another one we've had for a long time. We mentioned earlier, we owned MTY Food, Alimentation, Kushtar, Boy Group, each for long periods of time. But Constellation would be the winner because we still own it. We owned it since the beginning. Jason, any other ones that come to mind? In the past, we've had some that we had for a long time. Paladin Labs would be one. I think we had Dollarama for a fairly long time. I think we had uh, a First Service for a, for a long time. We still have uh, Colliers. 
So yeah, th- th- those would be the major names. So let's discuss another business that your fund owns, which is Ready Shred, which most people think just does paper shredding, but it clearly do quite a lot more than that. Can you guys explain why you own this business and what you think its future prospects are like? We found the business, again, years ago, we've been invested in this for a few years, because you could see when you were looking at the income statement that it was actually a good growth and profitable business, but they were over levered. So we went to them and we said, okay, well, let's help solve your debt issue, which we did. We helped invest into that business, solve their debt issue, and then they've been off to growth phase since then. But why we really like the business is one, the unit economics of running a shredding truck are really good. So can you scale it? And then the management team in place is phenomenal. So they're on top of all their metrics. And if I were to say, you look, well, what does a shredding company look like? And just to use kind of a number that everyone would know, but they have 30 plus percent EBITDA margin, right? For a shredding company. Okay. Can you scale it? And yes, the answer is yes. They've been scaling extremely well. And with scale comes route optimization and the ability to kind of, it's called bailing your own paper. So you actually can resell for more than you could otherwise. And all this kind of comes with scale, right? What's the market missing? The stock trades extremely cheap and it's, again, it's grown well and it has, it has a long runway still in front of it. But the idea that people always push back on is paper use, right? So yes, paper use has been declining for something like 20 years at a gradual pace, right? But what has been happening is the actual amount of paper making it into shredding boxes is increasing, it's growing. And what does a shredding company care about? It, it cares about the paper in the boxes, not necessarily paper overall, right? So it's going in because of security reasons, paper that needs to get shredded because, well, there's new regulations that say it has to, or just the way it's getting used, or and from an environmental standpoint, a lot of younger employees know that if it goes in a shredding box, it actually gets recycled. Versus, for example, in our office, if we throw it into our garbage beside our table, it doesn't get recycled. So there's that aspect to it of actual the volumes of getting shredded are increasing. So the idea that it's a declining market isn't necessarily true, but everyone would, at first glance would assume that. You kind of go through this whole idea. It'll never trade at a premium valuation, but the idea that, that it's growing at 20 to 30% a year at really good margins and will be able to do so for a while and trades extremely cheap. That's, it kind of ticks a lot of boxes, even, even for how small it is. I'd like you guys to tell me a little bit more about your investment in Go Easy. It looks like a high ROE business that is guided for an ROE that's above your 20% threshold over the next two to three years. When businesses guide for growth like this, how likely are you guys going to trust what they say? Obviously, you're probably pretty comfortable with M management, but I'm interested in knowing uh, how you guys view this company's guidance. There's a couple of reasons why we're comfortable there. We've been invested with this company for a while. So management says something, we see what they do. You know, Do they actually live up to what they say? But also before I, I got into the, the hedge fund business, I was a financial services analyst. So you know, I used to analyze companies like GoEasy. So I'm fairly comfortable with their model. When the government recently changed the whole lending structure for like the super high interest stuff, I was very re- relaxed with that, but the market sold off, that kind of stuff. So I would say a combination of we have a good trust or with management combined with the fact that I know a little bit more about this industry than, than the average Joe. I think those two factors mean that for us, we know that GoEasy is always going to be super volatile because it becomes kind of a proxy for people's perceptions of whether the economy is strong or weak. So we live with that. And then, and if anything, if there's a sell off, you know, we would add to the position. But that said, we have a pretty large position in the stock. They're very, very comfortable with it. But a lot of companies that are uh, like, like subprime lenders, lenders, that kind of stuff, like Go Easy, we say they have a lot of headline risk. There's a, a headline in the newspaper about something to do with the economy. The lenders all sell off kind of stuff. You just have to live with that and know that that's just part of the game. So let's move into some of the small caps and uh, micro caps. So why are small and micro caps in Canada so inefficiently priced? Have you guys observed this inefficiency in other geographies as well? How long has it been this way? And do you think it's likely to change in the future or is it just cycles? Yeah. So I would start with like Canada versus the US. So we started looking more closely at the US, I don't know, five or six years ago. And we thought the fund would, would have more exposure to the US. But the, just the difference in multiples, the quality is, you know, in Canada, we have extremely high quality, but it makes doesn't make a lot of sense to invest in the US names that we're finding because we can find cheaper, higher quality names here. So that that goes to your question of like, why? And obviously, Jason, I think you've been in this industry for long enough. You 
you have your thoughts on why Canada might be underpriced versus other countries. I don't know if it's a, once again, I think a lot of companies in the States are discouraged from going public of the size that they do in Canada. So I think, I don't think it's like their small cap market is more efficient than ours. I think that ours is actually relative to the size of the country, a lot larger. And it goes back to the whole CPC kind of way of thinking and, you know, Western Canadian entrepreneurialism and all that kind of stuff, right? But as far as why that segment, the microcaps are, generally speaking, so inefficient, that, that's the whole story. Because if something goes wrong down there, you, you don't have a lot of liquidity, that kind of stuff. And you don't have institutional money in there pushing up valuation. So as you go from large to medium to small to micro, the valuation should come down, right? And you know it's a risk reward. If, if you're comfortable going into that area like microcaps, we're probably more a small to mid-cap fund with some microcaps. You've got to be really patient there. You have to recognize that it's kind of like a venture capital almost with a little bit of liquidity. So you really can't play these where you say, oh, well, any day I want to, if I want to take 100000 or whatever off the table. In the microcaps, you can't do that. You have to basically say four or five years from now, it's going to get taken out. It's going to move up very sporadically. It's going to always trade on very low volume. And, and you've got to use that inefficiency to your advantage, not, not be beaten up by it. And then you mentioned like the cyclical nature of valuations. Again, I would, I would reference kind of the newsletters we've written on our website, but what we're seeing in the current small cap space is all time lows in valuation. So what happened in the kind of the 2021 tech craze, and then everything kind of blew up, sold off. Guess what? Everything sold off indiscriminately of valuation and earnings and business outlook maybe except the large cap names that everyone knows about. But what we've seen is, yeah, there was there, 100%, there was definitely companies that should have sold off. They were a bubble, they were overvalued, they shouldn't have been trading at 100x, whatever multiple. But there's, we have companies that were trading on 12 times that, so, that have now sold off to four times, like cash earnings, net cash balance sheets. And that's the market we're living in now. And you know we've referenced this idea of a pendulum before, but that's kind of the cyclical nature is, we think we have a basket of stocks in our fund that is literally the cheapest that we could have, that we could find through history. And we compare it to 08, 09 bottom. And we think the stocks now in the fund are cheaper with higher growth margins than 09. So that's kind of, it's crazy to think about because it's a different segment of the market and it's not that NASDAQ's hitting all-time highs and it's Apple and Amazon and Google, Microsoft. That's just not the world we're living in. And then that's kind of where, where we see this opportunity is these names are just so underfollowed at the moment. But if you go through history, that it's a cycle and the, the cycle swings the other way. And so that's kind of how we're positioned is for that cycle to swing the other way. What are your catalysts going to be to narrow the price value gap for some of the, some of the heavily underpriced names in your portfolio? In your most recent newsletter, you discussed how you believe that interest rates were the prime culprit for suppressing value of many of your holdings. Are there other macro catalysts outside of declining interest rates you believe that will help re-rate some of the small cap names in your portfolio? Yeah. So I think rates are number one, right? Like your discount rate you use on your valuation is exactly tied to interest rates, right? Interest rates go down. Technically, the value of your stock is worth less. Like it, That's what's happened with fastest increase in interest rates in history. But that being said, we think that's peaked. And then so people will start to look at these small growth names. But to your point, are there other macro issues? I don't think I see any. I'll let Jason answer too. But what we've also been seeing is kind of activism and takeouts, right? So we ourselves have been pushing some of our names to really increase the amount of buybacks they're doing because those companies will look back years from now and will be astonished with how accretive some of these buybacks at these levels will be. From that standpoint, and we're starting to see a little bit more of takeouts, right? Where if a stock is really worth what we think it's worth, a company will come in and, and buy it out, right? So that's what we're starting to see. I would say that's only within the last kind of few weeks, month. I think the interest rate cycle globally is, is the big one, right? And I don't think interest rates are going to go much higher. The question is, are we just going to stay up here or are we going to roll over, right? Other stuff that, can, that is interesting that's out there that could be positive for small caps are the following, the, the, the war in Russia and Ukraine would be one, and China figuring out its place in the world, given that everybody's de- 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 like disinvesting in China, right? All of these things all speak to a phenomenon which we, we refer to as risk on, risk off, right? And Kyle, you, you know that, that term. So we're, we're, we were in a massively risk off 
uh, posture up until probably three or four months ago. Then the large mega cap techs started to roll and now it's starting to trickle down. So we're not back to normal as far as sentiment and all that kind of stuff, but we've, we've just started to turn that corner. Interest rates are going to be the big driver. I would say the war in Ukraine and then just China figuring out whether it's a growth story or not. And I think that's, that, those are kind of add-ons. I don't think the war in, in Russia is, is sustainable. I don't, I'm not sure what brings it to hand. Is it a coup? Uh, you know, does Putin get replaced or God knows what happens, right? But Russia's already lost the war. It's just a question of when they realize it. So in your January 2023 ROE reporter, you said that the portfolio went through some painful losses. However, the bulk of your investments were on pace to have record years in terms of fundamentals. As of right now, this quarter, are you still seeing massive improvements in the fundamentals of some of your highest concentration bets? So companies are reporting right now. So we're, we're right in the middle of Q2 results, right? And so generally speaking, the results are coming in. What's kind of not happy is if a company comes in and they miss by one or 2%, they're often getting whacked by 20 or 30%, right? And we, we know that that's the way the algos are starting to trade the markets now, right? So you're getting these hyper reactions to small misses are resulting in massive movements in the stock. Now, given the nature of algos, they'll do the same in the other direction as well. So we've got to be attuned as we move forward and we, and we tweak the portfolio that if a stock, and I'll use an example like Nuve has just been absolutely crushed and it trades on four and a half times earnings now, right? And it's growing at 17% this year, right? Like, so instead of growing at 20, they're now growing at 17 and that's the movement that this stock took. So we've got to be able to say, hey, are we going to, once it's settled down, are we going to add to some of those positions when they've been really, really crushed, right? You know, we added to die in Durham when it got down to kind of 16 or 17. So you got to let the stock kind of find its bottom and settle up and then be prepared to take some moves there. But some of these, these stocks, the, the misses are not even misses sometimes. Sometimes it's a little change in their working capital. And the sell-off of the stock is just, un it's unbelievable. So that's part of that, the world that we live in. Yeah. So Jason's referencing a lot of the, the stock price moves. I'm just looking at the portfolio now. And from what we have, eight of our top 11 investments, which make up majority of the portfolio are on pace again for record revenues and record earnings this year with no kind of outlook that that'll decline going forward, right? So that's a majority of those names. And some of the other ones would be like a Collier's that slowed down because of commercial real estate, but it's still obviously making money and is strong business. But that's kind of what we were referencing before where just everything sold off indiscriminately. And now we're finding stocks, like Jason said, on four and a half times earnings growing at 17, 20%. That's just not sustainable in the sense of where stocks will trade. So yeah, it's painful in the short term, but as long as we're deadly focused on making sure, you know, revenue and margins and management teams continue to execute, like that will reverse what that's kind of how we're positioned. Jason, Jesse, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you guys and learn more about your fund? Yeah, we write a quarterly newsletter. So if, you, if you'd if you like to get on that list, you can email info at donvillekent.com or all that information's on our website at uh, donville, donvillekent.com. Okay, folks, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll see you back here very soon. The ones that, that sort of struggle and learn how to learn how to sort of survive on their own without that extra capital that, that you constantly need at an early stage, those are the ones that tend to be outliers. They they tend to learn the hard way. They tend to, you know, because there's a lack of resources, they're a lot more efficient with their resources, whether it's money, people, even their shares. Um, they, they, they sort of learn. It's baptism by fire, right? They're, they're actually learning out there.